David Prutton played more than 150 games for Forest under David Platt and Paul Hart. He then went to the Premier League for two and a half million pounds. He'll tell you all about that and his broadcasting career as well. David Prutton, next. Well, Prutt, it's fantastic to see you. Um, I knew you obviously as a, as a player. These mm -hmm. days you're a television celebrity and a star. <laughs> <laughs> um, good to see you, first of all. But when did all this when did all this TV malarkey begin for you? Well, and it is a malarkey. Well, thank you very much for having me on. First and foremost, it's been way too long, hasn't it? And I hope everything's yeah, going okay over there. Um, well, I got to thirty two as a player, um, and that rumbled to a halt when I was uh, I was on loan from Wednesday at Coventry, um, and then there was um, possible discussions about me staying on at Coventry after my contract had expired at Wednesday. But as is always the case, look at that super professional and it leaving you. Yeah. <laughs> and ironically, it's Nike Run Club, which is basically just reminding me that you've done nothing for about three days. <laughs> um, the, um, so yeah, and as as you'll know, when, when it goes to the off season, it just, everything, everyone vanishes, don't they? You know what I mean? Boom, yeah. let's get away from each other. Let's, let's have a bit of a chill. <clears throat> and then nothing in the, following june july really kicked up playing wise probably i mean you get to 32 and it's seen as as positively geriatric in football terms and i'd had a couple of injuries so maybe there was a question mark with that um so then i'd done a couple of bits for sky kind of like punditry uh, and guesting and stuff and then just the start of that season i had i had a good contact in peter Beagree, who's a very um wonderful presence at the outset um and just kind of reiterated to the powers that be through him that if there was more of this to do, then I'd be very interested in doing it. And there was a bit of um, a bit of a kind of holding pattern for a few months where the boss that I was checking in to was saying, oh, well, it's great to have your board, but we understand if something comes up. And the more I did it, the more I was thinking, I really enjoyed this. <laughs> this is this is far less strenuous than running around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it, maybe it's just a bit, from having done that from the age of 16, and it's and it's a wonderful profession, obviously professional football, and having experienced the good, the bad, the ugly of, of the whole thing. Um, maybe I'd got to a point subconsciously where doing something different was came at the absolute absolute right time, and and it's developed from there really. And there's a lot of things that um, transferable from football, a lot of things that uh, are newfound skills, if you like, if you can call them skills. But the fundamentals of it all underneath are, are the same thing, aren't they? Showing an appetite for it, an enthusiasm for it, and really enjoying it and, and hoping that that comes across um which so far touch wood seems to have been okay so how did you how did you actually do it for the first time did you i mean did you were you on screen doing it for the first time or were you kind of doing loads of practicing behind the scenes type there thing? was there was the, the guesting that i'd kind of done was basically you turning up and you hopefully at the start it's kind of if you've got a foot in either camp or prior knowledge of be it i don't know forest wednesday leads Another distinguished team that I play for. Colchester. Um, Colchester, Scunny, Swindon. <laughs> I, I, I've got maybe I've got, I've got a subconscious way of listing all those teams, which <laughs> probably offends a lot of people if you're not in different positions. Um, so that was <clears throat> that. That was a bit more um, reactive. So you kind of hopefully work with good people to ask her questions. Then the first time I did a commentary, which the first one was Burton Albion against someone else that I can't remember but that was a different kind of way of, of and you'll know this with commentary that this and, and it's even even more different for you because what you're kind of told as a co-commentator as an ex-professional is the the commentator tells you what's happened and the co-commentator tells you why it's happened you know what I mean yeah. so they, they call it providing color which I think is a very grand way of filling in the gaps when the really brainy fellas not talking <laughs> and you give me the benefit of your experience and uh, so that was that was a different thing, that you, a different kind of approach that you had to try and get your head around. And that yeah, that involved stuff that I really enjoyed doing, which was speaking to managers pre and post matches, um, touching base with, um, I don't like to say whoever it was, whether it was a League One game, a Championship game, and having worked on other uh, for Premier League. Uh, Premier League TV with games around the world. It, it, there's a, there's a, there was a slightly different approach at the start because, with the greatest respect, me doing Burton against, I can't remember who it was against, but there was you had to really 
scratch the surface and speak to managers what's going on because I, I always thought as well and if you speak to players for teams and I've, and I've since said this to a lot of managers that I've come across and to a mat to a person they've all been absolutely wonderful with the time because if I'm going to sit there for an hour and a half and not just pass judgment on what's happening in real time on the pitch but hopefully trying to give it some context then you absolutely have to take the time to pull your finger out and go and speak to the manager about what's going on about why he's set up like this so the background to this particular player or what he, what his experiences have, have informed with regard to how he goes about his football management now, and I, I always took that as a real privilege to be able to speak to these managers. Some would be quite guarded, others would give you chapter and verse. <laughs> Are you thinking that's almost too much now? <laughs> yeah. um, some would give you the, some would give you the teams. Steve Cottrell would, it, would always answer the phone with, "Do you want the team then?" <laughs> I was always like. Give me 20 minutes to butter you up first. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, this is out no of the fun. way before, before yeah. we go full, full bob. Whereas others would just tell you to sod off, which I thought was quite funny. So that, and that was a different uh, discipline. And then moving forward into what is predominantly what I do now, which presenting for want of a better word. Um, again, that was a different skill set because of, again, I'm, 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 I'm preaching to the converted here with you, Robin, that, that, that if you are part of what's going on, and you're not just reacting to questions, then there's certain things you've got to get to, like breaks <laughs> and yeah. features and interviews. And the bosses get angry if you don't get to exactly. them. Exactly. <laughs> Especially yeah. when you've got a company as big as ours that's built on that type of thing. If you don't, won't be tired, you'd missing a break. Wowzers. Um, <laughs> so, it, uh, and, and that was a different thing altogether, which again was, which I th- from what I've heard and what I've seen of Sky, uh, and the, they've been wonderful to me since I walked in the door, there is the element of go on then let's let's see what you can do and not and not in the sense of just chucking you overboard but in the sense of uh we'll soon find out whether he can do, do this or not yeah and hopefully if you can't there's a bit of um leeway to help you but um i just i got asked to do it four or five years ago now and as ever and, and hopefully that's predominantly my approach to my professional life and hopefully you do it as well in your personal life is just say yes and then work out the details backwards there you go yep yeah, i'll do that no worries and then you think oh, yeah let's, let's try and get stuck into that but and, and again to a person everyone that i've worked with uh, at least to my face has always been <laughs> very kind and very helpful and very nice yeah the support makes a difference i wonder what see if i'm asking a question of a mm. footballer or a former footballer mm-hmm. as a presenter I obviously come, or from a listener's point of view, I come from a position of mm. no knowledge, or at least the listener can assume I have no knowledge. But you obviously have played <laughs> played in all four divisions, did you? you certainly played. Yeah, in the apart from League Two, which uh, okay. I'm not saying that as a badge of honour because it, you look at There's it now, time yet, the skill level, I'd have been absolutely nowhere near it. Christ. <laughs> but um, but I, I know where you're going this, Robin, because it's something that was possibly, and I, and I speak to my producers a lot, and and. Um, which is good because, and I've always said to them from from the outset and it is given my background in football that um feedback and reaction is absolutely paramount and don't sugarcoat any of it I mean you you played for people like Paul Hart and Gordon Strachan you knew absolutely all the time where you stood whether you'd done well whether you'd done not so well whether you'd got on his nerves or got already pleased in that particular match day or training day. So I said to him earlier on, I said, if, if there's something that you like, tell me to do more of. Uh, if it's something that's getting on your nerves, I'll try my best to stop it. Um, and everything else, uh, I'll work as, as hard as I possibly can on it. And one of those things, and I do need reminding of it every now and again, it's po- possibly because I like the sound of my own voice, if you can imagine that, um, <laughs> is, is simplicity of questions there's there's they would they'd pull me up i don't know on the odd occasion where they go just listen to this question that you asked to somebody i don't know however long ago i'm listening to it and first i'm thinking there's no question in there yet <laughs> and i'm still going on and i've all and i've almost answered what i've put out there to yes. to bring it back so then the guest whoever it is is kind of left with nowhere to go so when you watch unless it's unless you're watching i don't know Newsnight and paxman going after someone well, it's about making sure that the person that you're with is comfortable enough to tell you the answer to the question that you're asking, which hopefully, as you say, if you're a viewer, viewer or a listener, it's simple, simple enough 
for it to be answered. Don't we? It's, it's funny because we're, we're talking about something that when you hear it being spoken about is so inherently simple, but the structure of conversation I find absolutely fascinating. So me asking a question that I possibly already know the answer to, mm. you've got to be able to do that properly because you don't, you don't want to come across as smug. Do you? And you don't want to come across no. as... But the audience this, knows. But obviously, know the answer, and we all know the answer to this. So but the audience knows no you know there. the answer as well. Yes, but then on the flip side of it, is, and and please believe me when I'm not comparing me to this person that I'm going to mention. But what Gary Lineker does so very well yes. is he broadens out that conversation. So we all know that Gary Lineker's. I'm saying that there's possibly a generation that thinks the fellow with the grey hair and the glasses on TV, he's a pretty good presenter, isn't he? And uh, he's, <laughs> yeah. he's at prime time. Didn't realise he used to oh, play so, a bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he got a golden boot in a World Cup. Yeah, he did. He was a really good player. Um, so what he manages to do, and I like watching, and I, I do, I do watch uh, a lot of other broadcasters, if you like. Uh, and um, what he manages to do is is kind of broaden out, so it almost feels like you're sat there with them and having that chat, but. You read on the conversation, there's there's not that element of look at us three ex Premier League footballers yeah. that have played for England and you're just watching us. It's a case of, well, Gary Lineker's is interested, so he's trying to bring us into the conversation, which without getting too deep and meaningful about it, is there is an element of that because the people that we spend time with, um, and I'm I get I get asked it sometimes about what people are like or who's got on your nerves or what's such and such like. And I can't think of when I've been sat there thinking, God almighty, I've got no interest in what you're saying uh, you know what I mean the way you're coming across I'm not enjoying everyone's been great and I, I've if I think about recent months with Mick, with Mick McCarthy at the weekend who who's brilliant but of a certain um um background and history of course Neil Warnock but I mean probably probably managers and and, and former players that there'll be a certain bracket of person that thinks football has come light years since these fellas were properly in the pomp but I watch them and think, well, played against your teams. Uh, I've seen you up both in action. I'm genuinely fascinated myself to ask you these questions that we're talking mm. about. And hopefully you get people on board at home that are, hopefully you're asking something similar. But I'd say nine times out of ten, the people that I'm sat with, I am as intrigued to know what they think about what I'm asking them as, as hopefully people are at home. And then it becomes specific possibly to the team that you're playing. We've got, we've got Hull against Huddersfield tomorrow, tomorrow night. We got Michael Heffler, of course, part of the side that took him up uh, under David Wagner, uh, and it's just a great presence. I mean, forget mm. the fact that English is his second language, and he's, he's as erudite and funny in English as he is in his native tongue. And we get people on that perhaps sometimes English is the first language, and you kind of go, "Any <laughs> chance of life?" <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it's it's just it's just inherently a pleasure chatting to these former players. How do you look back at your your Forest career? If we come on to the football. That, yeah. that spell, I wrote it down, 155 appearances, which surprised me, actually, because I thought it was a shorter spell than that. Yeah. Um, the, the first portion was amazing. The second loan spell was a complete disaster. Uh, but it was because I, I was, and I know Paul's been, Paul Hart's been on here, and I, and I was with him the day before yesterday, just over in Newark, chatting to some scholars that he's involved with um, at Newark College. And... Um, it's strange, and it, it, when you come across someone that you have known from 15 who was a real mentor and a real kind of guiding light in, in your professional and personal life as, as, a, as a younger man, and how quickly time passes. I remember him sitting us down as, as YTSs, and in, in, as you go in the dressing room doors of Forest, not the dressing room doors, the entrance to the dressing room, and you go up to the boot room that's in front of you, you take a right onto that long corridor, and then it left to the tunnel, right-hand side, home team then it's away team then there was the other dressing room at the top of the left and it felt like there was about 100 people in there when you when you sat there as a YT just like all huddled in and you know what lads of a certain age I mean they're not shy if Christ it, I mean it, it must have must I mean walking past like fumes coming out of it must have been <laughs> disgusting but um um so that for, it was so it was I joined in 98 and then left in January of 2003 right at the end and it was it was just an absolute pleasure. It it was it was a very competitive group of lads, but competitive in the right way. That from what I remember, even though we we're all there to do the same thing, we we're all there to become professional footballers and play for Forest. There was nobody sandbagging each other. There was nobody 
trampling over someone else to get to the next port of call. I, I think there was a general, and this is probably the culture that was set by Paul and the coaches was, <clears throat> if we're collectively very good and we have collectively very high standards, then more than the norm might get through to become professional footballers. And of course, within that, the, the dropout rate would have been huge because as you know, football starts like this and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until if you're lucky enough, you kind of squeeze through the little tube at the top and go on to have a, have a career as, as, as a professional footballer. But it was, it was just enormous fun. And it was, first time I moved away from home at 16. So you're moving to the digs just underneath the Bridgeford, um, Bridgeford end. So you've got a lot of lads in the same position, a lot of lads um, away from home and trying the best to, to make the most of what they've got. And I just remember training in the youth team being fiercely competitive. I remember the games being very competitive, whether it was it was the under-17s, we had the under-19s in the Premier Youth League. And then obviously the, we had the chance of playing in the FA Youth, which was amazing. Uh, and then I, the second year, I got into the first team when David Platt was in charge. And... Again, another man. I, I was actually I texted him the other week actually because I, there was there was a, a commentator a friend of ours that a touch base with him ahead of an Italy game that he's doing. So he wanted a bit of feedback about Roberto Mancini, uh, and David's kind of taken a step back and, and doesn't really do much in football. I think he's he's a bit of family time looking like I think he's been running his son's football team, which I'd read on some obscure Manchester Evening Telegraph column from two years ago, um, but. Was was wonderful for me it, when it, it, there was a lot of. I, I, I do understand in the grand scheme of Forest ex Forest managers, David Platt, and he'll know himself is isn't up there in, in in the kind of um the big the big side of what um of where you stand in, in the pantheon of all, of all these managers. But for me, it was great. He gave me a chance to play in the first team. Um, I had a chance to play with him, played in midfield with David Platt. How utterly ridiculous is yeah. that? Ridiculous, and he was. Still probably the best finisher, one of the best finishers in training. Um, a fit fella that could still get around the pitch. Uh, and then <clears throat> between himself and Steve Wiggly, who again was another really kind of guiding light in, in my career, especially the early parts, um, was a pleasure to play for. Then when Paul came in, it was... Because um, I well, another thing that I had to do as well was say, like, we'd play on a Saturday with the first team. I had to come in on a Monday morning to go and say hello to Paul and the coaching staff. And, I was like, oh, here he, here he is. He's the first team. You, you know what it's like. Here he, oh, nice of you to join us. What's, thought, you were, thought, you were, thought you were crap on Saturday. Okay, cheers for that. <laughs> Which was quite obviously his way of making sure that you didn't get um, uh, above your station. Then when he took, took over the first team, brought everybody with him. And then that team that then I think the Forest fans saw, which was very, very flooded with youth, was a really exciting bunch of players. Make sure youth and 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 um. It's, so were you a bit? I'm 20... trying to think. Are you a bit older than the the kind of ones that came through nah. with Paul? Well, I was I was the same age as Gareth Williams. I was probably right. a year older than JJ. I think Reedy and I are probably the same age. Doigi, probably the same age. Right. I'm trying to think. Well, Barry Rose. So you were genuinely picked ahead. If you like, as the well, as the first was, yeah. one of the first of those. Yes, I think I'm trying to think. There'd been a there'd been a caretaker spell for Paul Hart when it, I think they'd gone to play Coventry, and I think Chris Doig had gone with them, and maybe Gareth Williams as well. Um, and I'd played a few reserve games. We, we played a reserve game at Chelsea against Stamford Bridge, which, as luck would have it, I think David Platt was there, and I'd had, I'd had a pretty decent game, and. Um, and then there was there was a lad called Kevin Doyle, not the Kevin Doyle that went on to play for Reading Wolves, but a young Irish lad, midfielder, had been at Leeds with Paul. And I think something had happened and then and then he, he moved over to, to to Forest. Very, very technical, very good footballer, nice bit of bite about him as well. And he was probably next off the rank before me, potentially to get into the first team. And about two weeks, maybe three weeks before I made my debut. In, in my head, it's this. It might be longer than that, but in my head, it's that kind of sliding doors moment where he, they played a reserve game at, uh, against Wednesday, uh, Sheffield Wednesday at the training ground just down the road from Hillsborough. And he got absolutely smashed by this kid who um, I think I think, I think think he might have... This, this lad, I can't for life me remember his name, but there was something about a group of 
YTs from Wednesday that had gone away to um, somewhere in the off season, like some I don't know party party island or whatever, and he, he never made it back because he, he'd taken something and it, it was a bit tragic with what happened. Um, but this player had had uh, tackled, I say tackled, Doyler and and snapped his tib and his fib like. like to the point where when he'd come back, we, we all went to go and see him in hospital So because I was driving by then. So we went to the Queen's Med, I think he'd have been, and um, visited him. And, and it, was, it was all, by the time we'd got like a day or so later, he was he was a bit more settled. But you looked at his leg and you thought, geez, it looked like a, a shark bite because it had been absolutely smashed. So then that's him out the equation for the best part of six, nine months. And, and I don't actually think he probably ever properly made it back. Um, so... That point of view of me <clears throat> turning 18 in that September and getting the game two or three weeks later is like a lot of um, uh, careers in football timing. It's about yeah. being... In, right in the, place, in right the divide, time. Exactly. And then they've had injuries or suspensions in midfield, uh, whether that was... Um, and again, you don't know where that comes from or how that comes about. And, and so the, the door opens and you get the shout, oh, we're playing Bristol City in the League Cup down at Ashton Gate. And... I mean, I'm trying to think if I got told before we got there or when I got there that we were playing. Uh, but then, from what I remember, good bunch of all the pros, Bez, Dougie Freeman, I texting Dougie yesterday about something different. Uh, Alan Rogers, Chris Bart Williams, who kind of gave us all pretty much short shrift until um, until such ta- until some such time as otherwise he, he actually accepted that we might be half decent. <laughs> um, and it was... Um, it was just a real. It was a really good. Inv- I mean, it was it was merciless. You had to come in and you had to assert yourself. And 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 I wasn't. I, I was I was quietly. I thought quite confident. But I mean, greased hair and spotty face and all that type of stuff. And, and did you have long hair back then? You grew it. It, it was point. it was kind of in between. Do you know what I used to do? It was kind of. It looked. This it's pathetically getting a bit back there now, which at forties is, is is just so sad. But I've I got can't a compete, it, 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 can't it might compete. be my last. It's, it might be my last hurrah, so I'm going to give it a go. Um, but I was—I just—is um, that you? And is that a picture of you on the? Uh, yes, on the that's, wall that's behind. me there when I, yeah. when I was writing the poem, can't I? Um, but so I was, and it was—it was getting to a certain length, and it, and it was always one of those things where pop, get your hair cut. I mean, get your hair, you know, all those like the classic things that come from being a, a, a young player. But I used to put bas- Vaseline on it to keep it out my, um, out, out off my face and off my, which is if you've got crap skin like I've got is the most ridiculous thing to do because all you do is sweat and all this horrible sticky stuff runs down your face <laughs> so uh, whether I whether I had uh, an, an admirable if horrendous lack of self-awareness I, I think look all right don't have people thinking oh my god <laughs> and it's before I started plucking my eyebrows in the middle because I used to have the eyebrows that used to go right across the front um because I'm in TV now, it's you know what I mean, darling. It's yeah. all different. You've got somebody to do um, that for you now, <laughs> exactly <laughs> from a distance. Um, so it, it was, um, so it, it was, it was a little bit earlier than the other, the other, which was good in a way because so when Paul took over, because then David Platt moved on to the to the under twenty ones, and then I subsequently not because he was my mate, but got quite a few under 21 cats, which it was something that Paul had mentioned as well, because what he always <laughs> used to do, so if you weren't playing for like the under 18s, the 20, when you come back, regardless of what that next game turned out for Forrest or, or how he did, you just prepared yourself that he was going to bat here for something. Just, you know what I mean? Like you didn't track back that one time. I didn't like the way you, your sock fell down. You just thought, because it, that was his way. And I absolutely understand that. It was like, oh, yeah, you might have done great, but you're back here now. Here's your bread and butter. Yeah. And he was saying, I remember saying something off the cuff about playing, and you might get some more under 21 caps for being half decent instead of just having your mate in chat. <laughs> Which, <laughs> when you're like 18, you 19. 20, like, what did you get? 25? 25? Something ridiculous. Something. But then the, the the next part of that conversation is probably it's 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 probably a quiz question on the crappiest quiz anywhere. Who got the most under twenty one caps, but then completely fell off a cliff and never got anywhere near? The, no, the, there's, there's better examples. The actual international surely. team, but, but it was um, so it was one of those, and and it was, it was as I was saying. So when Paul came in, and I'd had my feet under the t- table and everything. And it was just, it, it then became what we had in the youth team, which was glorious to then what we had in the first team. Because if I remember rightly, if things hadn't gone to plan during the course of a game, it was the board that got it in the neck. It wasn't us. It was never, we were never like booed off for anything or anything like that. And 
get into that season where, <clears throat> so I left in the January, and I remember vividly watching on TV Forrest in the playoffs against Sheffield United um, and how close they got. And then obviously given how the, ne- the, the last 20 two years 21 years has transpired yeah. how close they were with that team at that time to get back into the Premier League it would have been an amazing feat an absolutely amazing feat but I think yeah so before me JJ moved on Dors and Reedy probably then moved on laterally I mentioned Dors before because obviously he's now a big part of what we do on Soccer Saturday and I know he gets on really well with, with Jeff and I remember saying I was in so there was used to be a producer that works on Soccer Special and Soccer Saturday who's since retired and lives up in North Yorkshire, massive Spurs fan. And I'd mentioned in passing that I knew Dorse, which to me was just knowing Dorse. It wasn't knowing, with the greatest respect, David Beckham or Maradona or anyone like that. And he went, you know Michael Dawson? I said, yeah. I said, I said, played with his brother, lived with his middle brother and played with him. So yeah, they're just the Dawsons that I've known since I was younger. Oh, do you think he'd do a bit on here? So I was like, I'll, tell, I'll text him and find out. So I'd, I'd half mentioned to him saying, oh, you should come on. Oh, I'd love to. Text him about, about an hour later. Well, they want you to come on and do this. Whoa, whoa I'm not <laughs> sure. It's a bit soon. It's a bit soon, perhaps a bit soon. Like, you silly sod. Pull your finger. You'll be old before you know it. You'll be finished. You need to you need to get your mind on doing something else. So, uh, and then he kind of, not saying I'm remotely responsible for Michael Dawson's broadcasting career, but I am. <laughs> um, and, he, and he's gone in and done great because like I said about people being natural with Dawes as you've yeah. probably seen and known and, and spoken to all three what you see is what you get which I think is a glorious yeah. thing and also you always knew with Dawes I think once he stopped playing and, and lost mm. a bit of the reserve about criticising and you know something yes. coming back to bite you once that's gone yes. I think it gives you so much more freedom doesn't it yeah, and, and the thing I've always found with that is as well, uh, when I have spoken to players or ex-players or current players, there is that, I understand there's that resistance completely. And again, the, the medium now for, I mean, look at what's happened with Harry Maguire over the last England game. And there was, there was an article I was reading with Danny Mills talking about Roy Keane's very vocal stance on what he's seen from Harry Maguire. And... <clears throat> You you pay to listen to Roy King because he's Roy King. He's an amazing former footballer, mm. uh, and I think an, an engaging TV presence. And from what I've heard, for the people that work with him in and around Sky, a total pussycat. When you know, what I mean, to the camera really? people, right. to, yeah. to and, and so so therefore he's doing it in that and far bit for me to pass judgment on Roy King, but he's doing it in the right way. So everyone's like, oh, Roy, he's lovely, he's lovely. You know, what I mean, just a cup of tea and a biscuit is fine. A cup of tea and a biscuit is fine where other people might come in and start up demanding whatever. But, and then obviously when it, if he's got something to say, he'll say it. Um, so there, and I, but I do think there, there is a, there is varying degrees of that spectrum that you, that you've got to work in. Um, so when you get players on passing judgment about other players, from what I've seen, unless I've, unless I've not come across these players and it's a bit different now when you're asking questions about players, I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a respect for, an honest opinion that doesn't seem to be, that isn't actually loaded or um, kind of anything other than me judging or someone being judged as a footballer. I, yes. I think I think there's, there's got to be a broad acceptance of that, I think, at every level of football, because given the nature of the sport and the size of it across the globe, particularly the Premier League, what's come with that interest is riches beyond a certain level of players' wildest dreams. And I'm, I, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not a generation of players that's going, bloody hell, I've been playing bloody now and all that type of stuff. But that's that's the, the playing field that they that they operate on. You look at, you mentioned before, didn't you, about talking about chatting about things on YouTube. The amount of broadcast content that comes from people talking about football is staggering, absolutely staggering. Yeah. And if no one gave a flying whatever about football, then there won't be an industry to support that. So I was watching uh, a thing today on, on YouTube about um it's a Gary Neville thing with Carragher and Keane. And the overlap, it's amazing. The overlap, it's fantastic and it's brilliant, amazing. brilliant content to watch. It's had a, I think it was a million views. It's been out 24 Branding, hours. Because it's because it's because it's um again, he's another one I've come across, Gary, who's who, who's lovely, absolutely lovely. He um he's got his persona and he's got He's very serious way of coming across. I texted him about uh, 
a family friend of, of ours that had been through a bit, this young kid, um, and he was a Man United fan. And this was in lockdown, so I just said, could you send him a text just to say hello? He sent me a, uh, a WhatsApp video of him uh, checking up on this young man and Ryan Giggs checking up on this young man, wishing him all the best. Right. And, and, and like, yeah. you're going, Jesus, like the proper Man United players there, like taking the time to say hello. So I've got nothing but good things to say about Gary and, and what they're doing with there. And he's another, he's, he's kind of that, um, he's got so many, like he's got the energy of about a thousand people. So many things yeah. flying in different directions and that what they're making there, I think is fantastic because with the audience, you've got that instant accessibility, haven't you? And it's done, it's done in a good way. I mean, I'm sure the, the, the fine line between how that could quite, quickly go chaotically wrong if you get people just acting like they do at a football match <laughs> yes i'm not saying hoing coins to anybody but <laughs> no getting, getting very affronted by what's going on I, I could see that but i think and again like i say the the views that are racked up so quickly with it i mean you look I, i'd say you look at figures possibly for something like that and um when i first I'll end up getting doing, more than than watch a sky premier league game that's 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 exactly the point i was making i, I was yeah. under presumption that and maybe that's that's the that's the beauty of of the perception of what live television is. I was like, ah, oh, what? Prep Super Sunday, oh, twenty million people, and the producer yeah. was like, Are "You mental? No, twenty yeah. million people? No, that's." And it was it was a it was a, a small it was it's still a significant number, but you still in your head you think, "Well, that's crazy." I, I, I presumed it was that other thing. So. But um, but yeah, that side of it, and and, and passing up. Plus, there is always that cachet, and it but and it is slightly different now because we we've got to be broad and open minded to know that um, there is opinions on football that don't have to come from playing at X, Y, and Z. And I think as and again, Instagram, YouTube, all kinds of different platforms will attest to very, very, very knowledgeable people. I've come across some amazing ones. The two lads that do. Uh, the not the top twenty podcast over here, which is um, George Alec and Ali Maxwell, um, both lovely fellas, really good company, forensic in their analysis and opinion on uh, the EFL. Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, so, and they've now got an avenue for that to to be appreciated have, by other people, which, which, which is, and, and I think there is that fine line. If and I, I've only ever sporadically watched bits of. Say, say Arsenal fan TV, for example, um, where, the, and again, this this is a probably a tiny portion of what they actually do, <clears throat> but I'm not an Arsenal fan, so I'm not particularly bothered about chasing down uh, that type of thing. But um, somebody talk, talk to, uh, a fan talking to a fan outside a game when the team's been crap. Oh, I, 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 sack him, he's rubbish, he's that. And then you're kind of going, well... I understand that opinion because you're very emotional off the book, but it's not remotely inform informative no, or constructive no. or particularly entertaining. If you're going to be none no. of the none of the above, be entertaining. If you're yeah. just going to go and rant, not bothered at all. So um, that's what it that's what it is. That, that, so, like I said, it, it's it's a broadening it's a broadening uh, landscape, which uh, you've got to be open-minded enough to have a lot of time for people that come from all different aspects and have whole different opinions and, and are able to be challenged and also challenge you with regards to debating what is inherently the best game on the planet. David Pratton will tell you about his return to Forest in a moment. I need to thank my members of Chippers Club, particularly the Gold members who will get a mention in a moment. It supports the channel. The link is in the description below. If you want to become a member of Chippers Club and watch these videos uh, without ads, you can see the full version and you get to see them more than a week early as well. The Gold members this week are Henny the Hero, Tiny Media, Philip Sheldon, Chris Annable, Paul Harrison, Christian Tonnies, Perry, James Sorden, Thomas Newton, Mark German, Alan Francis, David Shelton, Mark Davis, Ez Chowdhury, Paul Metcalf, Tim Hayward, Richard Waterhouse and Ian Russell. Thank you for your continued support of the channel. As I say, the link is in the description below if you want to sign up for a small fee every month. Let's get back to David Prutton. Come back to you and that move to Southampton. If memory serves, it was it was very late, was it? It was on the final day or it was close to it. it How was did it all come about? We, it, we, it took a while because I'd been offered a new contract at Forest, and I remember seeing Ian Bowyer. Oh, I mean, and as before, before I get onto that, I mean the tangent of 
the players that you would come up because I, I watched um I believe in miracles you know Johnny Owens mm. um very good take yeah. on the European Cup adventure and it's amazing as a younger player 16 17 18 that because they were part of your everyday life, you kind of took them a bit for granted. So when Liam O'Kane was kicking around, when Bomber was one of our coaches, like teaching us as midfielders about the facets of being a midfielder, and then you you look back and you go, Christ, Bomber must have just been thinking, <laughs> yeah, who on earth are these lot? Yeah. Like, but I, I, to be honest, that says a lot about them, that, you know, Bomber, who is such a great guy... Lovely. And a heck of a player. Yep, and you unassuming. would never know how good a player he was no, if you chatted no. to him. And Not I mean that in the best how, possible way. And how fundamental he was to the success. How unbelievably mm. um, kind of cemented in, in the, the cornerstone of that team. Jo- we'd see John McGovern come in, Larry Lloyd come in. I mean, the, uh, with, and again, with the first, the greatest respect, when Larry first came in, I was like... He's a big bugger, isn't he? And then <laughs> yeah. someone explained to me who Larry Lloyd was, and I was like, that keys us no way. <laughs> uh, and and you just just absolutely blew your mind. And and like the likes of Gary Bertel was working with Gaz. And I mean, there's there's so many you can you can come across Viv Anderson. There's there's so many that you can reel reel off. Um that um just 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 a, such a pleasure and, and watching that film again just reaffirms how magical it is, and that's the reason why. Muppets like me get a chance to play for a club that people have heard of because of men like that. So when it came to, so I, I'd been offered this contract and I said to Bomber, I, I spoke to my agent, Bomber, and uh, don't think it's quite right, quite the time to sign. And you know, Bomber's like, oh, yeah, no worries, Prutz. And Paul wasn't in this day. <laughs> I noticed you didn't uh, talk to Paul. You spoke to yeah. Bomber. <laughs> well, then the next day, or it was either a Friday and we were back in on a Monday and Again, where the coach's room is, Andy Beasley had come out the coach's room, taking uh, the left to the boot room and Prats. And it was always one of those when you heard your name shouted down the corridor, you thought, I can't, it's never a good thing that your name was shouted out. And if it was someone else, you're always like, yes. Not me. <laughs> Gaffer wants a word. So I've gone down <laughs> uh, and Paul's gone. Uh, contract. And he said, Paul, I don't think it's it. Stop you there. Sign your contract. <laughs> he went, what? He went, just sign it. It's good money. We're going places. Get on board. Sign it. Well, Paul, I think it said Jesus. And it was it was a bit of a standoff. So then got through training and, and then I spoke to my agent. He said, well, you just got to kind of hold your nerve here a bit because we've had sniffs of, of Southampton being interested. So it, inherently, God, oh, Christ, the Premier League. But again, Forrest were doing fantastically well at the time in and around the playoffs. Um and then it, it, it kind of dragged on for about a week, a lot of to and fro in, a lot of kind of frostiness. And, um, morning, 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 morning. <laughs> oh, right, see you, bye, yeah. Your husband um, and wife, you've had a tip. Exactly. And everything that you're doing in training was, wasn't good enough for all, all that, you know what I mean? <laughs> Bloody hell, Prutz. I mean, you'll do well getting anywhere. <laughs> all that type of thing. Uh, and then got the green light very late on the day before, I think it was. Or was it? Which meant that I tore ass down to where my agent lived on the M25 somewhere. But there's a bit of it which, I, you know, when you think about things, you think, have I dreamt that up? But I distinctly remember being stuck on the M1 for, or, or the bottom end of the M1 because it was, the weather was horrendous. So I ended up sitting in my car for about three or four hours thinking, like, this is, this would be a good story to tell on a, on a podcast <laughs> in 20, 20 years, uh, less than 20 years time. Um, and just kind of didn't get to my agent's house till very, very late. My first thought was getting to his house was Jesus Christ, I'm being an agent instead. This house is massive. <laughs> this is what I'm paying for. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What on earth am I? Yeah. Wrong, wrong profession. Um, and then the next morning we went down to Southampton. Gloriously sunny day. I met uh Gordon Strachan, Gary Pendry, Rupert Lowe, and then signed, and it was all it was all very straightforward, like and which um the um medical was all straightforward, which as I got older, picked the they became less stra- straightforward the more he did him like tell me what's wrong now um <laughs> and then but didn't sign in time to, to play the, the game the next day which was against Man U but was sat on the bench and I just remember walking down the corridor and it was the Beckham Van Nistelrooy and you're kind of going Jesus Christ oh my and it then it became quite real thinking what on earth am I doing <laughs> how is this gonna pan out because they were all 
And again, I don't know whether it's that one that you kind of remember with a, a slightly kind of sepia tinted view on it, but they're all big, they're all big dudes. I mean, you know, nothing, nothing on David Beckham, but he's he's not he's not short. Van right. Nistelrooy, not short, big big fellas. And um, just thinking, wow, this is this is a different, <laughs> literally a different, it's a different league. league now. Literally, yeah. it's <laughs> a different league. Um, and this this is this is what it is. And it was just an immense challenge. And um, for the first few months, it was proper like fish out of water stuff. Fish out of water because we had such a good group of people um, at Forest, both on and off the pitch. A lot of lads that got on really well, a lot of wives and partners that got on really well as well. And, it, and a group of young lads that, there's only really Jono that had kids at the time, which blows my mind now because I've not had a chance to say this to Brennan yet, but I will at some stage. I remember when you, when your mum was pregnant <laughs> with you and that, he'd probably thinking, Jesus. Uh, and you look at what he's done now, which is wonderful. Um, but it was, it, was, it was a really good group. And then to go down there, which Southampton to me seemed miles and miles and miles and miles away which it is um was and it was just felt like training was it was a even though our training at force was amazing training was a step up you play the little boxes game where you had to two people i mean it's a it's a drill as old as the hills in football two people in the middle everyone around the outside um keep the ball to two in the middle and, and, and it felt for the first six months i thought i wonder what it's like on the outside like i've, <laughs> I've, got, I've got no idea but Unless I'm running around in the middle trying to get the ball back, I can't for the life of me. And there was there was lads that I kind of knew of a little bit, um, and other players that I'd never heard of at all who were twice as good as me. And you're just kind of thinking, this is crazy. This is this is what the biggest league on the planet looks like. And it was it was a shock to the system, um, but one I'd never changed because there there is another part of it which, having worked in other. Um, broadcasts uh, for other broadcasters there's one I, I mentioned earlier on that, that beams Premier League content around the world if you are introduced before oh hello I'm such and such to these amazing commentators that you work with and of course I'm here with former Premier League midfielder player, David yeah. Brutton which yeah. wouldn't if I'd have stayed at four, it's all hindsight we might have gone up I don't know you just don't know but that, that means that they can I mean that is even if it might go some fans of certain teams, that is factually correct. Yeah. <laughs> a former Premier League midfielder. Regardless of how yeah. many times it was, how good the games were, who we played against, what that team did, it's factually correct, which um, having they seen some social away media, you. again, and having seen some social media, is always a good sticking point to go, well, technically it's right. It might get <laughs> right up your nose, but technically that's right. <laughs> I'll ask you about one thing at Southampton. Can you guess what it is? Uh, did did it occur in 2005 by any chance? <laughs> it might have done. Yeah. Because well, I can remember being, I think I was at the city ground, but I remember them buzzing in my ears as I was so presenting. It's gone, to say, something's gone tits up very something's quickly. Something's gone really off at Southampton. David Prutton's been sent off. It looks like he's pushed the referee. And I remember thinking, I, I didn't say it on air because I remember thinking, no, that's not right. Not props. Not of all yeah, the people. I don't, and I don't want him coming after me for defamation. <laughs> no, absolutely. So right, we'll just wait for confirmation of that, can we? Give it a couple of minutes. So what the heck was, was going on? Yeah, it was. We, we we were having a crap time of it as it was because we were fighting at the, at the wrong end of the of the division for a team that had always managed to to perform the great escape, and quite obviously, as history pans out, that wasn't going to be the case this season. Um, we played Arsenal. Harry Redknapp was in charge. I'd been booked already. I mean, the first challenge on, I think it was on Matthew Flamini, who's was now some kind of re re renewable energy billionaire, isn't he? So is that right? No, I didn't know that. Yeah. So so our our <laughs> your parts have got yes. yeah, sli slightly <laughs> different, slightly different. Um, and I was proper pumped up, uh, and I'm sure there's there's possibly one or two Forest fans of a certain era that would testify to what I was like when I was pumped up, which was probably out of control. And uh, so went to tackle him, Alan Wiley, who since I've worked with and, and get on with really, really well, booked me and kind of was like, what on earth are you doing? Can you just calm down? And then I went to tackle Robert Perez, <laughs> which again, me, me and him in the same sentence, let alone on the same pitch is laughable. Um, and thought in my very sane 
taken it. Oh, I won the ball there. He's diving, a French man diving all over the place. And I remember seeing a, a picture on the, on the Monday morning, which was like my face contorted in rage with a straight leg on his ankle. And his ankle was bent and he was like, uh, like that. Uh, and then it all kind of kicked off and me remonstrating, pleading my innocence, the classic, whoa, whoa, never touched him. Never touched him, ref. Never touched him, ref. And then the, the linesman flags gets him over. And by this time, I'm like, what's the linesman getting involved for and dipping around? And so that so the image that you see from that is me trying to move Alan Wiley, who bless him, is up, like I said, love Alan to bit, is about here on me. <laughs> right. So I'm looking over his head, moving him around. Not to like knock him out, but like, I, I, I mean, I don't know what I was going to do once I got to linesman. I'm like, just admonish him or whatever. Um, but that's, it just looks like me manhandling officials. I mean, which in any sport, in any, in any kind of professional environment is absolutely, obviously a no-no. So then he books, because I, I don't even think it was a red card. I think he booked me, just booked me again. So two red card offences that I actually just got two yellows for. Not that this was my um, my argument in the dressing room after, no. and this was just before half time, and um, Harry comes in and he, I mean his voice can be quite high pitched anyway, but I mean it was off the scale. He was absolutely raging, um, and then as the, as the day kind of transpired, it, you realise then that it's it's going to become bigger than um, nutter in football match goes nutter. It becomes a, 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 a bit bigger than that, and obviously with the company that I work for. Um, we love rolling news, <laughs> so mm. it's easy to play it again and again and again and again. <laughs> um, so you had to deal with the fallout from that, which was a lot of people in the papers. It's quite right; they call me an idiot. I mean, a, a, a reflection on footballers of a certain bracket that are animals, basically. Um, uh, and I think my, I'm trying to think, my mum and dad were there as well. So I mean, a doubly proud moment that my parents got to see it in the flesh, <laughs> exactly where it was, and then. Uh, off the back of that, me and Harry had to go to the FA in Soho Square to go and get the knuckles wrapped once again. So you go around this big board table in these lovely wood panelled offices, three men that, I mean, average age of about 95, <laughs> someone from, I don't know, pluck one out, Shropshire FA, somebody from there, someone there. And and I had Mick Maguire, former footballer who worked at the PFA, now works for, I think works for a talent management agency. And he, he was my um, counsel, my uh, rep. So he, he, he went in and he was chatting away about um, where we, we were trying to mitigate. So he went through professional season by season, my disciplinary record, which the more he's saying it, I'm sort of like going, Jesus, mate, this isn't helping, mate. Oh, but was it was like, see, I wouldn't have had you as bad. Well, the first season, so first full season, <clears throat> I think it was around 15 yellow cards and a red card. Ah, ah okay. And I think, so it was always double figures, I think, from, from yellows right. and with the odd red thrown in. So, but then it had got marginally better, but I thought, if you start there and, and just what? Mm. And, and I just saw the, the fellas like looking at, <laughs> like, what? And then they went out to go and to go and um, deliberate. And then Harry had to shoot off. He said, Christ, Prutz, you... You've got more previous than Reggie Cray, and <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was a was a very it's good very line. Funny line. Yes, yeah, but I thought I can't I can't come back in and start laughing. And then they came back in and said, "This is what you're going to get. You're going to get a ten match ban. You're going to get fined X amount of money, uh, and that's it. You know what I mean? You're going to have to take it on the chin. You're going to have to deal with the media consequences of it. And 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 the great." irony as well of it was was we had 11 games left so it wasn't even like season over not that I was going to go oh gaffer by the way can I get myself off for a couple of weeks because <laughs> uh because that would have gone down like uh, a final lift wasn't it but then so then uh, as the seat so watched kind of gnawing my nails as the season progressed and we were looking like we're getting out of it and we'd slip back and we're looking like we're getting out of it then I came back for the last game of the season which was Man United at home after not playing for the best part of two months two and a half months and I started the game then right. I'd try my best to stay fit, but we were just nowhere near it. And I think, so that, I think it was called Survival Sunday, I think. But it was in our hands. If we'd have won, we'd have stayed up. But we, oh Christ, we just weren't good enough to beat Man United. So it ended up in that sense, falling off a cliff, us coming out of the Premier League. Um, and it being an infamous portion of my career, which um, 
at every subsequent club. It only took a matter of time. Like, nice to meet you, nice to meet you. What on earth were you doing? <laughs> so the referee, oh, go on, let's, here we go, chapter and verse. There you go, lads. Any more questions? No, let's I'm do it. I'm sorry to have on. asked. <laughs> no, it's perfect because on the one hand it kind of as you walked into these places maybe, maybe it give you a bit of like um not kudos like it was like, oh i mean what's he like is he he's gonna be a... and then obviously hopefully as people get to know me they realize that that is that is the uh, hopefully the very small seed somewhere that very 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 occasionally gets let out and bursts out into that type of fury but fundamentally chip as i'd say because I'm totally biased that I'm a really nice fella. It was a surprise. That's why, for the listeners to Radio Nottingham, if they're thinking that they've not given us the news about Prutton being sent off, I was just, I needed it triply Double confirmed. Check what it is. I need to make sure. Yeah. So anyway, Great you're sec- you came back to Forest on loan. I did. Uh, with did, Coldwood yeah. as manager. Cole brought me back. Uh, how was, uh, you said it was a nightmare, I think, a moment yeah, or so yeah. ago. I mean, I mean obviously there was this. There was the yeah. sending off yeah. um, in the playoff you know, you know, semi-final. When, when you, it's, it's like if you listen to somebody who just had lots of crap relationships, after a while you're listening to them going, if you're not meeting weirdos, uh, I'd look at yourself. It's possibly <laughs> that. So, yeah, I'd come back. They were um, in League One at the time, obviously gunning for promotion out of there, making a decent fist of it. I'd not played for a while at Forest. Uh, so I had a chance to go back to familiar surroundings to try and and, and I played with Cole, so Cole had come on loan, I think the back end of his career. Hmm. And I remember playing in the game, the Birmingham game, which finished him, which broke was his leg, again yeah. broke his leg and dislocated his ankle. <sighs> Jesus. Um, so we'd done so he'd kind of given us the chance to come back and play. And possibly not having played for that long, I was probably a bit off off the pace. And then the um the semi-finals against Yeovil. I was ill for the first leg where they'd done the majority of the donkey work and then came on for the last 20 minutes of the second leg where, again, they'd done the majority of the donkey work and then proceeded <laughs> to unpick all of that by um, getting booked twice in a very short space of time. Fouling Nathan Jones twice. And I've worked with Jonesy and I, and I consider him a, him a friend and a colleague. And I always say to him, you got me sent off there, dive twice. He went, no, didn't you smash me? I was like, no, you dive twice. And he was like, oh, just benefit my experience, mate. You shouldn't have gone flying in. I was like, yeah, right. Yeah, right, yeah, right. And then, um, so then that petered out. And then a couple of days later, because I was out of contracts um, at Southampton, so I kind of, I'd been on, ostensibly on loan there with them, hopefully for us taking over my contracts when we got promoted. And then we all sat in the first in the dressing room. We're all going over to the manager's office for meetings. And I think I was eighth in. The first seven got released. <laughs> so I was thinking, uh-huh. this isn't going to... So I went in and, and I, as I said, I know Cole, lovely fella. Uh, and really enjoyed watching his coaching career, working on it like I do now. And he kind of went, it's not good news, Prutz. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I'll be honest. I was, I'd have only been kidding myself if I thought it would have been. So chairman's not happy. I said, well, that's fair enough, fair enough. So shake hands, move on. Then you come off the back of that and you think, Christ, I need to go and find somewhere to play football now. And having come across Dennis Wise at um, Southampton latterly and said something off the cuff as he was playing for us about him being quite old and not as fit as he was and then proceeded to show me in training, in a running session, how unbelievably fit he was at mid-30s. And I knew there was a player and a manager in there that I wouldn't wouldn't mind playing for. So thankfully he gave us a chance at Leeds, which turned out to be a really enjoyable time in my career. But yeah, it it was a shame that it ended like that. But I think hopefully it's maybe slightly different now because I think there's a a section where you pass judgment on a former team professionally. And because we love our clubs like we love our babies, anything that's said to the contrary is taken very, very personally indeed. And, I was chatting. We'd, we'd done a game last season. Uh, no, I not crash one last season. A couple of seasons ago, where we were at the city ground and we finished the game, and I was walking back to the train station, and there was there were three Forest fans. One was all right, one hated me, and the one in the middle, <laughs> like, was is is was undecided. And his mate, the one that hated me, didn't talk to me for like the whole way down back towards the station. He says, "He's got the ass for you." I said, "Well, why?" Because you said the other week we weren't going to win. It's like what? I said, I said, because we sometimes talk about who's going to win at a weekend. Um, yeah, you never say we're going to win. So, yes, I do. 
yeah, we, you don't. You never say we're going to. You're always down. To like, what have we ever done to you? And I was thinking, geez, is that the perception? Is, is, there, <laughs> is, there, is, there, is there like a, a, a faction that think that I've got anything remotely other than warm, lovely, friendly thoughts towards Forrest? But I said on the, I said on the other occasion, I'm, I, I can't in this little thing that we, I said, I can't say that you're going to win every week because that sounds mental. <laughs> If you're winning every week, you'd be top of the league by a country mile now. Oh, well, pff, you know what I mean? Just you know, basing on the lines of sod off. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that, that's so there is, uh, there's a lot of different dynamics going in. But anytime I go back, it's it's wonderful. It's, it's, it's where your proper formative, not just football and experiences were, were kind of fostered, but as an adolescent, 16 years old, think you're cock of the walk you've got a lot of growing up and learning to do and that's where a lot of a lot of that took place perhaps thank you so much for your time it's been um well it was a pleasure dealing with you as a player you were always interesting to chat to about this that and the other so thank you for that <laughs> uh, thank you for your time today as well you've uh, you've been very generous and you might have just broken the record in terms of uh, the longest one we've done so thank you very much it's much appreciated it's it's my pleasure and and it's as you, as you as you can guess as well, Chip, as you can see that I'm it, it's not it's not it's not a, a a completely conscious thing where I try and talk for as much as I possibly can. But being verbose when it comes to dealing with uh, things that hopefully people can see there's a lot of tongue in cheek and a lot of reverence for where I've been. That that's that's the biggest thing that should come out of that. The people that I've managed to come across there, what it gave me professionally and what a glorious place it is, and the lovely people that you come across where you are in that privileged position is, is something that will always stick with me and being able to reminisce um, as we do uh, when we get to a certain time of life is, is a pleasure, isn't it? So it's, uh, it's wonderful to catch up and I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks, Prats. All the best, mate. <laughs>